Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruid and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Stanislav Beletsky. Stanislav is a lecturer at the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature at the University of the Doma in Tanzania. He lectures on field linguistics and lexicography, and he conducts research on Isanzu and Gogo languages. His interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, the documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and lingobotany and ecological knowledge encapsulated in them. Please join me in welcoming Stanislav as he gives his talk today, which is titled Songs of and Elements of Ihanzu Fairy Tales. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I would like to, today I would like to show you some of the uh, ongoing pieces of research. Uh, I'm involved with the lecturer who have this wonderful opportunity to be in Tanzania because I work here at the University of Dodoma, teaching Russian language as a foreign language, and I'm doing research on Bantu languages. So let me start this uh, brief introduction about the language in the area where the speakers of this language live. So this language has several names. So in different catalogs, it can be found under different names. Isanzu, Ihanzu, Ki Isanzu, Kin Isanzu, Kin Yasanzu, but the name the speakers used to refer to their language is Ihanzu, Ihanzu. Uh, but in English speaking, in English literature, in literature written in English, uh, I found more often the name Isanzu spelled with S. Yeah? So this language is found in Tanzania, in Singida region, in Iramba district, uh, and in some villages. Um, so the core of the language territory is Ihanzu village. So this village is named after the ethnical group Ihanzu. Uh, so in the uh, in the formal, uh, in, the, in the Gasri classification, this language is labeled as F31B, so it means it's a dialect, it's considered to be a dialect, but the speakers consider it to be a language on its own. Um, and this language has retained several, seven vowel systems, so some ancient traits. So, um, According to different estimations, there are 30, from 26 to 34,000 speakers. So ethnologue indicates 34,000. Atlas of languages of Tanzania indicates 26,000. The atlas was published 2009. It means the research was done even before. So this data is quite outdated. The latest data come from the ethnologue, so 34,000. Based on the number of the speakers, this language is considered to be threatened. So the level of endangerment in 6A, it is not in, uh, severely danger, endangered, but threatened because of the number of speakers. So speakers have positive attitude to this language. They, they try to pass it to the younger generations, but the problem is younger generations are involved in the, uh, in, in the Tanzanian life, they're Tanzanians, first of all, but only after that they are Waisanzo. Yeah? Uh, that's why they prefer to speak Kiswahili. So Kiswahili is endangering actually this language, yeah? because it, it offers more opportunities, of course. Um, there are not so many descriptions of this language. So um, one description is done by Marcele. Mm, and the description is based on, so on, on a list of core vocabulary. So in that places, I could find around 1,000 words from Isanda, along with words from other neighboring languages. So the, 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 the research is about a comparison, lexico-statistical comparison of the items of the zone F, of the languages of the zone F. So Isanda is... As of data, 
So Cassandra is not in the focus of, of the research. Um, together with my colleague from the University of Dodoma, I tried to compose a brief morphological sketch of this language. So it was published 2019. Uh, also, Andrew Harvey did um, research on this language and he collected extensive data. And this language is documented thanks to Andrew. Um, and there is a um, social linguistic description of the Situ the linguistic situation done by the Summer Institute of Linguistics, but long time ago, 1996. So um, we don't have many publications about this language. That's why I decided to work on it. Um, current research is a part of the project of the University of Dodoma which is titled Lexical Documentation of the Sanzu Language, and it is supported by the Endangered Language Fund through Language Legacies Program. I put the logo here. Um, so this research is based on a short field stays at Haidu in Manyara region at the Kitua Chautamadun, the museum called 4CCP. And so far I had um, two short field stays in 2018, 2019. 2020 was not a good year to go out of the Doma for, for next field stay because of situation with coronavirus. So 2021, the same. Unfortunately, I was not, I was not able to go there, but next year I plan to go to collect new data. So the outcomes um, are publications, so uh, a short description of morphology of this language, um, a small contribution to the corpus that Andrew deposited to the Endangered Language uh, Archive, uh, presentations at two conferences, one uh, at the University of Dodoma, another conference was held at Mos in Moscow at the State University. So, Current study aims at description of songs in the hands of folk, folk tales as their structural component. Uh, so this research is guided by two research questions, simple research question. What function song playing within narrative structure of the folk tale, tales? What semantics do songs show? You know, what, what they are about? Data collection methods I collected fairy tales, folk tales through, through elicitation. I asked my consultant to tell me fairy tales, to tell me stories. Um, and uh, speak of this language, so I have two, I was happy to have two consultants and the, uh, the, the, the core consultant, the main consultant told the story to, to another one, not directly to me, because I was not able to understand the story and I was not able to react in a proper way. But the other consultant did this part of, of this ritual of storytelling. So the data is quite authentic. I wouldn't say it's like 100% authentic because I did not collect it uh, you know, in, the, in, the, um, in the environment where it, would have come naturally, but still I tried to create such an environment. So one native speaker is telling a story to another native speaker. Mm, totally, I have 10 traditional narratives, but only six of them uh, contains, uh, contain folk tales. And in these six stories, I found nine songs. So this is the data. Analysis is a simple morphological, structural, and semantic analysis based on the theory that I'm going to explain. So the consultants, they're both native speakers. Uh, they're both men. Uh, one is age 58, the other is age 62. Uh, Salim and Joseph. So Salim was the main consultant. So they're both born in that village. They never lived outside of the region. They don't speak other languages. Of course, they speak Swahili, but uh, and they don't speak foreign languages. And that's why I consider them to be proper consultants. 
So functions of songs, uh, according to the uh, to the research on Zulu songs on uh, songs Zulu folk tales, uh, we can identify seven functions. Songs are means of audience participation. So song is sung together with the listeners. So the storyteller, the narrator, starts singing, and the audience is supposed to join him in singing. Her in singing. They dramatize actions. So songs are inserted into such points of the narrative where the narrator wants to create this dramatic effect. Songs aid in character portrayal. Um, so th th this function is obvious on the data of, so of um, folk tales about animals. So animals are portrayed with songs. So the narrator imitates sounds of these animals. He imitates uh, the idea of this animal as if it were a human being. So he tries to imagine which kind of voice that human being would have. Songs convey the theme of the story. So sometimes uh, the song encapsulates the event itself, one of the events in the chain of the narrative. So sometimes a song is equal to the event that forms a part of the narrative chain. Songs develop plot. Uh, they are the movement from one episode to, to, to another. So in uh, narrative, we have a set of episodes that have a beginning and an end. So when we reach to the end, we have uh, a problem, how to market and how to make a move to the next uh, to the next episode. So sometimes, Songs are used to mark this border between two episodes. Songs hide tension and suspense moving the story to its climax. Songs are sung at critical moments. So I, I, I did this research with the hypothesis that songs in the hands of folk tales might correlate with elements of narrative structure and or their functions. So I'm interested in some of these functions more uh, than in another functions. So functions one, two, uh, and seven are obvious to me. So uh, I, I, I did not uh, I did not want to investigate deeply these functions. So I'm interested more in functions number three, four, and five because. These functions show that the song is an integral element of the narrative. It's not, um, it is compulsory there. Yeah? So the narrative cannot function without the song at a, at a certain moment. So I, I was interested in such um, kind of songs that form uh, an integral part of the narrative. So this is the theoretical framework. This is a um, conceptual framework made up of several theories. So linguistic or literary theory of narrative, um, formal theory of traditional narrative, linguistic aspects of fairy tales. Um, and if I try to outline them briefly, then um, every narrative has a structure, whether it is traditional narrative or contemporary narrative, we, we are able to identify several phases in the narrative. So when we talk about oral narrative, we should keep in mind that it's, it is a process. It is not a process, it is a process. That's why I talk about phases. But if we have a, a written narrative, a text, then we talk about uh, components or elements of the text. So this elements are, these phases are abstract, orientation, complicated action that include mundane events, trigger event, most reportable event, resolution and coda. So abstract is a short announcement, uh, 
what the story is going to be about. Orientation is indication of the place and the character. So where the story starts and who are the main characters. Complicated actions. So this is the main body of the story. So the story starts with trivial, with something trivial, with something that is not interesting, but um, known to the listeners. So with events that are very well known. And then the storyteller will lead the listeners from trivial events to a trigger event and from trigger event to the most reportable event, to the dramatic event, to something that is uh, that is difficult to believe that it happened. Of course, when we talk about folk tales, they are imaginary. But even in imaginary narratives, um, there are some events that are difficult to imagine, and they are used as the most reportable events or climax in, in uh, linguist. Uh, I mean, in literary terms, they are called climax. Then comes resolution, so how the conflict is resolved and how the equilibrium is re-established. And the phase where the listeners are being brought back to the moment of listening, to back to, the, to their reality. So, um, so these phases can be identified formally because they have formal markers. Um, linguistic units like in, in Swahili we use in other Bantu languages we use narrative past ka that clearly marks the complicated action uh, topical structure can be analyzed through this free concept old equilibrium collapse new equilibrium so every story every tellable story, every story that is worth telling is about collapse of the reality of the usual things and reinstallment of the things in a new way. So equilibrium is lost and it is, then it is reinstalled. So this is the, the overall um, topic of every tellable story. And here we come to the main part of the theoretical frame. Um, events or morphemes of a fairy tale suggested by Vladimir Prop. So he is well known for his works published originally in Russian language, but then translated into other languages, of course, into, into English, into French, into Spanish. Uh, Prop was representative of the formal school of linguistic and literary analysis in, in Russia. And he was criticized a lot for this very formal approach to the analysis of linguistic structures, but still this approach works. It is, um, it is useful, although it's, it was developed several decades ago. So uh, Prop says uh, in his book, The Roots of the Magical Tales of Fairy Tales, uh, that we can analyze uh, a folk tale into several episodes, and they are shown on the screen, starting with absentation. So this is the episode, the event, when the main character leaves the family or leaves his community or her community. So, uh, and then events can be many, up to 31. So a fairy tale ends with the wedding, from abstain, abstentation to the wedding, but not all of them can be found in every uh, folk tale. Yeah. Some of them will be there, but not all of them. And there will be no any other event in a traditional story, in a traditional narrative. So this is the um, this is the, uh, the, the the most complex structure event structure of a traditional story of a folk tale. It, it has 31 components, 31 morphemes. These are morphemes of a, uh, a folk tale. Yeah. They call them morphemes in formal analysis. So 
So I try to find, I try to analyze those nine, uh, those six um, stories. Uh, I try to decompose them into these morphemes. And then I try to see if there's a correlation between the morpheme and the song. So where the song is placed, to which morpheme is it attached, like a submorphine? And I would like to just to go through all of these uh, songs. There are not many, there are only nine, uh, to show how this analysis works. So this is a story, the first one about the rabbit and elephant. So it, it's a very well known story. Um, so the, the rabbit is trickster. He is a hero and the anti-hero in, in, in Bantu folklore. So he's a hero, but he behaves like um, like anti-hero. Yeah? And in this story, uh, the rabbit uh, was caught by the farmer for eating the crops on the field. And the farmer wanted to punish, to kill the, the rabbit, but rabbit promised him to be a guard of the field and to protect this field from the elephants who used to be his friends. So he, he betrayed the friends. That's what he's doing in all the stories he betrays. He foolishes other animals. And for doing so, he entered into a pump, pumpkin a big pumpkin with a small um, filimbi. How do you call it in English? I don't know. <laughs> so I hear this filimbi. And when the elephants came and ate that pumpkin with the rabbit inside, he started playing a song using this musical instrument. So and I would like to play this song. Yes. Okay, this is flute, feeling this flute. Okay. 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 So you can hear the narrator singing the song and the listener joining him in singing. So this is the involvement. This function is obvious. But what about the intertextual functions of the song? So this song is developing plot. Song is the core triggering event. So after, after the song, the elephants are scared and they run away from the field and they try to find out the source of that, uh, of that sound that's frightened them so much. And they kill the, the main elephant, the baby elephant. Yeah. And after that, they try to punish the rabbit as a murder because they, they decided he is the murder of that baby elephant. So this is the triggering event. The song is the triggering event on its own. The song moves the plot to the next episode. Another function is character portrayal. So Munyangala or Sungura or, or rabbit is small. It is a small animal opposite to the elephant. So we have an opposition here, an obvious opposition. The rabbit and the elephant. The other position is the rabbit and the hyena. So in the second part of the story, the rabbit will meet the hyena. So in, in this story, we have both of them, both of these oppositions. So the rabbit is small, um, but he's clever and he uses magic. So he's like a his witchcraft uh, because this uh, filimbu is a magical gift 
actually. When we use the terminology of prop, this is a magical gift. That's why a small animal like rabbit is, was able to chase big and furious animals like elephants. And he was also able to beat the hyena, to kill the hyena. So what is the correlation here? The song opens villainy. I'm not sure if I pronounce it correct, but uh, anyway, it's obvious what is it. So this is the morpheme number eight in props uh, typology. Um, and um, this morpheme is used to introduce the crime into the story. So the crime here is the killing of the baby elephant. Yeah? This is the crime. And the phrase that I highlighted here, Pember League one, uh, means the flute foolish the elephants. So this is the core idea of the story. This is the core idea of the story that Rabbit was able to foolish the elephants using the flute, this film bit. This is the core idea of the story. And the narrator told me that he remembers the story through the songs. So this is another very important function of the song that was not indicated in the literature review. Song serves as a title. Of course, we have titles for the songs, uh, I mean, for the narratives. Uh, but the real title is the song itself, because songs are very short. And the song has all the core elements of the story. Mm, so you can remember the story with the most important details if you remember the song. A song is a, a, a very uh, good memorable. Yeah. So it, it, it stays in the memory because of this uh, shape. Yeah of the reasons. So let us move to the next story. Next story in, in Hulun and Kanga, uh, the dove and the Kanga, yeah, this bird. I'm not sure in English. I'm sure you understand this. This small chicken-like uh, birds that you can find in Savannah. Guinea Fall. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the story is about how these two birds became enemies. So they used to be friends, but one day they, they had an, uh, an argument because of the different ways of bringing up children. So the dove has a nest on the tree, but Guinea fall makes a nest on the ground. And they criticized each other for doing this job in a improper way. Yeah. Um, and the, the fight, this battle is done through the songs. So we have two songs, uh, the Dove song and the Guinea Fold song. So I would like to play them. The Kukidia, <laughs> So the birds are calling the nature to help them to beat the opposite side. So the dove is calling the rain, the guinea fall is calling the wind to come to destroy the nest of each other. So the one who wins is the dove. Uh, the functions of these songs, they are developing plot because this song battle is a climax of the story and character portrayal. The songs have the element of imitation. So they 
the narrator is imitating the sounds of the, which these birds produce. Um, the songs correlate with the struggle morphine. It is labeled under number 16, so it's, it, it should be in the middle, in the middle of, of the story. And actually it is the middle of the story. So this is a struggle morphine. So the next story is Wangu um, Amanzi, so lack of water draft. Yeah? So one year um, the animals experienced severe there was no rain, there was no water, they couldn't find the water, and they decided to dig a well. And they all came to do this job, but the rabbit didn't come, and they decided to not to allow him to drink the water. Uh, and they asked the again the elephants to protect the well. But of course, the rabbit was clever enough to foolish the, the elephant and to drink water and to make it dirty. So he had some dirt on the feet and he jumped into water and he and the water was dirty so that so other animals couldn't drink it anymore. Of course they tried to catch the, so the, they tried to catch the rabbit and they caught him and he escaped of course in every in every story he escapes. So in this episode, the comes well with bombe, yeah, with a bottle of alcohol, and the elephant says him, tells him not to drink the water, but the rabbit replies, he doesn't want to drink this water because he has something better in the bottle. And then the, the elephant asks the rabbit to give him this bottle so the elephant could try it. And of course, elephant gets drunk. So, and this um, event is accompanied with a song, but the song is in Swahili. So I think it is like a, a, a lone part. Yeah, it is borrowed from the responding story retold in Swahili. Uh, so functions of this song, it develops plot. It is the core triggering event. Uh, the song portrays the character. So again, the rabbit is small, opposite to the elephant, but clever. And he uses, again, he uses magic, magical tool. So this kibuyo, a, a cup, yeah, uh, is a magical gift. Uh, songs convey the theme of the story. So the rabbit befooled elephants. Uh, he befooled the mlindi, the one, the, the guardian, the one who was supposed to protect the well. And it, it's... This word is repeated in the song, Linda, Linda, uh, but it is transformed. Yeah? It is transformed a bit to, so the, the narrator plays with this word and, and constructs a song out of it. The correlation, this song correlates with the villainy morphine. So the rabbit is the one who is starting a crime here. Yeah? So he's stealing the, the water from the community. So this is next song. Um, this is a song about, about a couple, about a husband and a wife. Uh, they didn't have children um, until the moment when the wife found a lover. And that lover was a snake, python, chato. Uh, and the song, the first song in this story is the, the, the song that this woman was singing to call the snake from the cave where it, it, it lived. 
So this was like knocking on the door. And woman brought some food to the snake, Ugali, and then they had sex. This is the story. It's, it's not my imagination. This is what, what I found in the story. Uh, when the husband discovered this behavior, he killed the snake and he ate the snake. And then he confessed it to the wife, uh, but wife was pregnant and she gave birth to one human being child and a lot of snakes. So, and the husband chased away those snakes, but one was able to hide in the house and it was the luck. So it was like a symbol of luck and prosperity. After that snake child uh, became an adult Jitu, and it's like a monster. It is labeled with this word Jitu, not human being, not an animal, something in between. So this woman and her human child became rich because this Jitu had a magical ring, Pete. So, um, and the second song is sung by the wife um, when she explains that she gave birth to this Jitu, this monster. Sato and Sato, Puna Giggins and Bane come out in the moon. Sato and Sato, Puna Giggins and Bane come out in the moon. O Kitty Rode, young Bane come out in the moon. Kitty Rode, young Bane come out in the moon. Kitty Rode, young Bane come out in the moon. Yadi and the second song. Aka Makosha Maroko, killing your kitty. Magosha Marogo, killing your kidney, Magosha Marogo, killing your kidney, Mambola kidney, into killing your kidney, Giran and Mekono, killing your kidney, Giran and Mekolo, killing your kidney, Giran and Mekono, killing your kidney, Mokaga Pendo. The functions of this song are developing plot. The first song is found in the orientation phase and describing habitual events. This was a habit of this woman to go to the cave and to sing this song to the, to the snake. The second song is found in the resolution. It's also a habitual event. So the woman was singing this song several times. Songs convey the theme of the story, sacrificial offering totemism and the price that people uh, get from serving the, the ancestors, serving this, um, Botanic gods, yeah. Correlation, the songs correlate with the morphemes 12 and 14, function of the donor, the first song um, correlates with the function of the donor, the second song correlates with the receipt of a magical agent. So this G2 is a magical agent. Okay. So the next story is Ihumulana Mintuchi. This is a story about twins, Mapacha. And it is a sad story. So um, there was a famine, and a woman, a certain woman, gave birth to the twins, and she decided to abandon one of them because she was not able to feed both of them. And first, she decided to abandon the, the, the girl. So the twins was the girl and the boy. Uh, but then a boy, a baby, asked the mother to abandon him but not to his sister. He asked the mother to keep the sister. Although it was a baby, he could speak because in fairy tales and in these imaginary narratives, there is no everyday logic. Logic is magical. Okay? And it is a magical baby. Yeah. And the mother left the boy in the cave of Baobab tree. But then this boy was found by a snake, a python, chato, and the snake brought him up. And the snake taught him to, to take care of the animals. So he was a herder. And with the herd, he used the well to the lake so the cattle could drink water from that place. And then he came to that place to, to, to the water 
reservoir. No? Uh, he was singing this song. So the song um, retells the story of his life, how he was abandoned by the mother. So one day his sister came to the same well and he and, and she heard the song and she was curious about who was singing and she realized it was her brother and she decided to bring him back home but he didn't want and people of the village had to catch him and to bring back home and they forced him to stay at that place although he wanted to escape they tied him to a chair to kitty and he was singing a kitty song so i i call it this way chair song to disappear so the chair was disappearing after this song it was like going down into the sand so this is the song <laughs> So this is how the boy disappeared. It was not a boy, of course, it was a ghost. So the functions of the story, it developed a lot. Uh, the first story is found in the orientation. So it was a habitual event. So the boy was singing this song regularly. It was a part of the old equil equilibrium. Then the song is found in the climax. climax. He is singing this song again after he was caught by the villagers. And Kitty song is sung in the resolution. It is actually the means of um, resolving the story. Through this magical song, the boy disappears. Song conveys the theme of the story, connection with spirits and connection between twins. So this Mapacha have special role in the in the beliefs, in Bantu beliefs, yeah. It's like, it's like Jitu, yeah, they're special. So correlation, the songs mark absentation, villainy and solution. So absentation is the leaving of the home place. So the hero leaves the home place. So he was abandoned by the mother. Villainy, um, this is a climax of the story. So the boy, was um, betrayed by the sister. So she wanted the villagers to catch him. And solution, this is one of the last morphemes in the construction of a traditional narrative 26. So song is served to solve, to create the new equilibrium. equilibrium. So the next story, Humula Kumba Tat. Uh, this is a story about three boys, three brothers. Um, they went to to savanna, to the to the forest, to Purini, yeah, Valenda Purini, with the with the cattle. And the last born, the one who is always suffering in these stories, because he is the last one and. He's the youngest one, and all the brothers force him to do a job they don't want to do themselves. Yeah? So they, they sent him to take some water, to fetch water from a well. And he had to go down into the well uh, using the, the steps. So he went into the well um, with a cup, with a cup made of uh, made of pumpkin yeah. to fetch water. But after that, the brothers removed the stairs and the youngest brother um, had uh, no way to come out of the 
well. So the older brothers went and left him in the well. But the cup he had was a magical cup and it helped him to go out of the well. And in the second part of the story, uh, this cup uh, turned to be a beautiful girl, a beautiful woman uh, whom he married after that. So the first song is in the well. The second is sung by that beautiful girl. Um, when she, so she was singing the song to convert from a cup to a human being. Unfortunately. Okay, so functions of these songs are character portrayal. So the magic cup. So this magic is explained through the song. Cup is singing, so it means that the cup is magical. Uh, and the songs correlate with the with two morphemes, the receipt of a magical agent and wedding with the last morphine. Wedding is the last morphine in every traditional narrative, uh, I mean folk narrative, folk tale. So this is the conclusion. So I try to I try to find some correlations between the functions of the story or of the song and the part of the narrative and the narrative morphine within a story. Uh, of course, the data is not enough to say that I have found some correlations, but still I got this data summarized in the table. And I plan to, to increase uh, the number of songs to see if I will have similar results. So far, I can see one pattern, uh, the Sungura song from Munyangala song, Rabbit song. So uh, Rabbit always commits villainy and the song helps him to do so. And the song, whatever story it is, I also have stories in, in, in Google language, and I could see it there, this rabbit songs, rabbit stories are all the same actually. They're all about this small animal beating and befooling big animals. And song is a crucial component because song is a kind of magic that helps him to achieve this uh, narrative goal, textual goal, to convey the idea uh, that if you're not that much powerful, but still you can beat your enemy using your creativity, brain, and intellect. Okay, I think that's all. Thank you for their attention. And I'm thrilled about your questions and suggestions. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting presentation. I really enjoyed listening to the, to the songs. Um, so yeah, we have now the floor for questions and answers. Um, so you can either raise your hand for a voice question or write a question in the chat and I can read it out. Uh, I will start with a question of my own. So in the beginning, you said that you collected 10 narratives in total. Six of those were folk tales. In the other four narratives, do you also find songs in that or are they really um, only part of the folk tale narrative type? In other narratives, so there are also fairy tales and peer stories. So I used peer film too to ask my consultants to retell the story. So there are no songs. Okay. And Andrew has raised his hand. Thanks, Anna. Um, and Stanislav, um, for this uh, talk, uh, yeah, I think it's really cool. It comes from a very uh, sort of different direction from many of the talks that we normally have. So I think it's really exciting and, and, and yeah, and, and, and super interesting. My, my first question, because I have a couple, but I'll, I'll save them um, for a bit later. My first question is almost sort of uh, a compliment to Anna's uh, question. Uh, so you said that in these, in these other stories that you have, there are no songs. 
my question is the songs that you have recorded actually in the stories do you have any sense of of whether these songs are 100 unique to the story in which they're told that is the song will only occur in that specific story or can they be used elsewhere? Can they be used outside of stories? Can they be sung as lullabies? Can they be sung at parties without the story attached? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I, I can answer it using my data from Google language actually, because I also collected uh, a quite big amount of uh, fairy tales in Google language. And I also was able, I was happy enough to find a thesis about oral literature in Google language. And in that dissertation, uh, um, I found out that there are different types of songs and some of the songs serve as lullabies. Some of them serve to um, like wise sayings to uh, like to, to support an opinion, yeah. Um, some of them, um, so the songs, if the stories are very well known uh, by the community. So the songs serve as a reminder of the story, as a title, they have this function. So the story comes out of the song. And this song may be used to, like for, for this hypertextual link, to link the conversation to a certain story for whatever reason, maybe to use the story uh, to support uh, an argument, to support an opinion, yeah, to exemplify something with this story. But the songs, uh, so uh, if, I, uh, if I answer to your question directly, the songs can function separately uh, outside of the, of the narrative but they're always linked to the narrative. They always remind the listeners about the original story. Very cool. So, so this, is, this is basically sort of your assumption based on, uh, on the GoGo -Go data, but in terms, of, in terms of the Ihanzu, we still have a bit more homework to do to see how these are used or if they're mm -hmm. used outside of their, uh, their narrative. That's cool, but uh, I mean, that gives us, uh, your work in GoGo -Go gives us a bit of a basis to compare if we see similarities or differences in Ihanzu. That's quite cool. Yeah, thank you, Stanislav. Thank you. Um, maybe this is, uh, maybe this is uh, not a super useful question, but I wonder when these songs and when these stories are kind of being constructed, do you think that I wonder, you know, which which comes first or which is more primordial? Do you think it's the story that begets the song or do you think that it's the song that begets the story? Like, or do they just, do they do they come up together? I don't know. I, I don't know if that's a legitimate question or not, but it sort of, sort of came to my mind. Based on my observation, um, so I think the story can be, um, uh, the song can be omitted or included into a certain part of the narrative. And the song should be known to everyone who listens to the story because these stories are known to everyone and they're being re retold, retold, and retold. There are no new stories actually. Yeah, this is like a closed system of a finite number of topics, yeah, stories, emerge like in the first story about the, uh, the, the, the the rabbit and the elephants and the pumpkin uh, there is another story so two stories are merged into one and the narrator so I remember observing the narrator remembering the song he asked the other co-consultant to help him to remember the song and he said in, in Isanzo, is it that our song? And he, he, like, he spoke the first line of the song and the other consultant told him, yes, yes, this is the song, this is our song. So songs are known to everyone 
And even if they are omitted, the listeners know which song represents which story. So if we try to reconstruct the original, the, the, the proto story, there should be a song to it as a short, um, like a, a short version that the listeners keep in their mind and their memory. So they create the stories out of the songs. So the only thing they have to remember is the song. The story comes from the song. They remember the song and they try and they start uh, telling the story. Hmm. Can I follow up on um, that answer? Sure. Um, so I think one of the stories you said that the, the main text was in Swahili because you think the story also came from there, um, but you say it's a closed system. So how shared are these narrative patterns across the different varieties in that region? And do they also share the same type of songs? Like, would you know or? Uh, so I could find the same stories in Gorita, also in Vibunda. Uh, so there is a book published by Karsten Leger, the stories of Vibunda people. Um, so stories about rabbit and elephants are widespread across Banto uh, territory. I think this is a common folkloric wealth. Stories about the rabbit and the elephants, at least. Um, some other topics might be found uh, across ethnical groups. So I would say it's very difficult to find a unique story that is uh, retold only within one ethnic group. So Bantu stories are shared by many of the ethnical groups. This is, this is like a common cultural wealth. It's not unique to a certain ethnical group. So that's why this transition from Swahili to Ihanzo is, is quite simple because the story is still the same, no matter which language is used to tell the story because the telling, um, the telling strategy, the discourse strategy is the same. You remember the song, you extract the story out of the song. And this song might be in Ihanzo or in Swahili. So the crucial thing is the appropriate reaction of the listeners. If the listeners co-construct the story, then the story happens. If listeners cannot co-construct co the story like I couldn't, well, I couldn't react in a proper way. So the story dies or the narrator switches to Swahili. So uh, this is what I know from my colleagues from the Moscow State University. They tried to collect stories in another small language in Twara, in Tanzania. They couldn't because they didn't know how to react. They were, they were not familiar with the discourse strategies of telling stories and the narrator switched to Swahili because he was interested in telling the story in conveying the meaning. That was his goal, to, 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 to teach a les lesson to the listeners, because stories are lessons, actually, yeah? about right and bad behavior. Are there certain people within the community who have the right to narrate certain stories, or can anyone tell the stories? There are storytellers, according to the type of the story. So here I base my answer on Gogo data and the theory of oral literature in this language. So Gogo people distinguish three types of stories. And for every type of story, there is a prototypical storyteller. So the stories I collected, the stories I presented today, typically are told by grandmother or grandfather. But grandmother is more frequent mm -hmm. the storyteller. In the evening, after the meal, after the after the dinner. Um, Marty, you've had your hand raised for a while. Sorry, I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit in in disorder, and I missed the first half. 
because I couldn't get on, on the internet. I, but I, 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 can, I can listen to that when it is because it is recorded. And I find, first of all, the songs beautiful. And I mean, you have been very lucky to have a very good singer because uh, I, all the stories that I collected, they often have songs, but not so beautifully sung. So congratulations on that. I was very interested in what you said about song as titles, because indeed we are often uh, struggling with the fact that uh, for somehow, for all sorts of reasons, uh, there's a sort of uh, uh, pressure for us to give titles to these stories, although people don't have titles. But it's also, in my experience among the Iraqu, absolutely true that uh, certain songs are linked to a certain story. Although they would never use the the song as such uh, to 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 ref as a title for the story, and and but. I have the same experience that in, in, that in your answer to uh, to Andrew that um, that you can you can of course sing a song outside of the story, but it would always belong to the story. And I have a story, but somebody doesn't know the song that he's supposed to sing. Um, and then, uh, um, yeah, he still continues, but it's clear that it's an omission. But in, I find, for, in my experience, there's a difference, for example, with songs between the Iraqu and the, and the Alakwa. Um, so the, uh, the Iraqu, they often, but not always, have songs in their stories. And then they are in Iraq, albeit that there are words and sentences in it that are simply uh, gibberish. I mean, they, people don't know what it is. And now that I, I hear your story about the hair and, uh, and, and the well that he's protecting, I have that same story and I have a song. I, I have to listen to your song again, but I think it's a similar song, although to the Aku, it's, it's they have changed the wording a bit and it's not so easy. It's just, uh, just sounds to them. And that is very different from the Alakwa, where they have every story needs a song. And before they start telling the story, they, they sing the song. And it's always in, in Rangi. And, and now we you have, and also many people have sort of uh, suggested that this is a sign of uh, where songs, uh, where stories originate. But there's always also in, in folklore studies, a sort of seems to be a, a stylistic device to, uh, to use uh, um, stylistic code switching to, to use yet another language when you go to songs. So there seems to be also something, uh, not, not, not by necessity, of course, but in many traditions, uh, a sort of habit, a sort of style to simply use another language for songs. So what, what is your idea about that? Mm -hmm. Maybe I have an example of this stylistic device uh, with that song in Swahili. Mm. Maybe it is the case. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I remember uh, my uh, prof uh, Tilo. He, he and that is not about songs, but in his uh, stories, whenever the rabbit talks, he talks uh, Swahili uh, because <laughs> he's so smart. You know, he can speak Swahili. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of that. <laughs> it shows his intelligence. So oh, I, I should come back to my consultants and to try to clarify this aspect. Thank you for this inspiration. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you had another question? Yes, thanks, Anna. Um, I, I haven't gone through the songs that were collected uh, by our Ihanzu local researchers to the same degree, obviously, as you, as you have, Stanislav. I'm really just beginning with that. Uh, but uh, I remember uh, 
having a meeting one day and it was brought up by both of them that said, you know, there are a lot of Ihanzu songs, but we don't know if you want them because uh, almost all of them are mixed with Nyilamba. They have Nyilamba words and Nyilamba phrases inside of them. Of course, Nyilamba is, is a language closely related to Ihanzu and, and geographically in contact in many of the Ihanzu speaking areas. I wonder, do you get any Nyilamba mixed in with your Ihanzu songs by any chance? Or is there any sort of sense that there are words, uh, you know, in some of these uh, utterances that can't be translated into Swahili. I've noticed that there are a couple words or, 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 or sections in, in the translations of your songs, Stanislav, that are, don't have really a Swahili translation. Um, so, so I, you know, of course, I encourage my local researchers to go out and record the songs, but sort of put it in my back pocket to recognize the fact that Ihanzu songs, at least the ones that we were recording, probably feature Nyilamba just as, as a part of the song? It's a difficult question because um, I don't have any resources about Nyilamba. So I was looking, I couldn't find, so I found on the, the Bible. So of course, uh, making research on Ihanzu requires also cross-checking with Nyilamba. But I don't have these resources. That's why I Actually, I cannot answer your question. Yes, there are some items that could not be translated directly into Swahili. They might be Niramba, they might be borrowings from other languages with which Ihanzu is in contact. I just omitted that part because I know I'm not able to analyze it yet. Yeah? So the focus was on the songs as a component of the structure. So I didn't go uh, to the songs um, the object of the investigation to the structures found within the songs. So I treated song as a component of the structure, not the structures found within the song. So that might be the next step of this research. I think that that's completely legitimate. And actually it's, an, it's a nice sort of methodological approach to songs because I mean, we all know that they're very complex and we might not at first, uh, at first encounter be able to fully analyze linguistically what's going on. So I think that your approach is actually really reasonable. Um, uh, and yeah, I completely agree with you, uh, Stanislav, to, to really sort of understand Ihanzu and understand the, the, the verbal, you know, the, the oral genres and to even understand the language. I mean, what we really need is we need a sister project in Nilamba uh, and, it's, and its various varieties. So um, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you have that same sort of sense because I, I I very much feel that in my in my work with Ihanzu as well so thank you for uh, for that are there any more questions or comments I hear silence so I think then we can finish up with that so thank you again Stanislav for this really interesting presentation and everyone for participating in the discussion of course uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentations in Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page, and the entries for each presentation also will be published in the bibliography. Uh, the next webinar won't be until the New Year's, and the details will be announced in the newsletter. Um, yeah, so it just remains me to say thank you again, and uh, wishing everyone happy holidays, and see you in the next year.